This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show. The award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Christopher Thornburg. Christopher founded Beacon Economics LLC in 2006. Under his leadership, the firm has become one of the most respected research organizations in California, serving public and private sector clients across the United States. In 2015, Dr. Thornburg also became director of the UC Riverside School of Business Center for Economic Forecasting and Development and adjunct professor at the school. An expert in economic and revenue forecasting, regional economics, economic policy, and labor and real estate markets. Dr. Thornburg has consulted for private industry, cities, counties, and public agencies. He's become nationally known for forecasting the subprime mortgage crash that began in 2007 and was one of the few economists on record to predict the global economic recession that followed. Dr. Thornburg holds a PhD in business economics from Anderson School at UCLA and a BS degree in business administration from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Christopher, it's been a long time. Welcome back. It has been way too long, Bruce, and thank you very much for having me as always. Uh, I'm excited. You know, it's an interesting interesting year you chose to start uh, forecasting economics, 2006. Well, you know, I was doing it before then. Remember, I was at UCLA and um, departed for any number of reasons, not the least of which is uh, the forecast, the UCLA forecast said that uh, Real estate was fine. And I <laughs> always say differed in opinion. Uh, ergo, I left and presented my forecast, which, uh, which fortunately for me, unfortunately for the global economy, came largely true. You know what's interesting about predicting if it's really a value, it hasn't happened yet. And so, you know, when you stepped up to the plate and said what you did, there was the real estate market was very strong. And you know, what you were looking at was what was likely or inevitable to occur, but had yet to occur. And what's, well, very, what's interesting too is, yeah, and I know you've had this comment. Yeah. So two years after the fact, somebody says, yeah, we, we knew that was all going to crash. I always like to say, well, could I see your document? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, look, historical revisionism is, is hardly new or hardly exclusive <laughs> to my field. Um, so that I all get. Uh, I would also say that, you know, my, my predictions I make um, are largely based, you know, a lot, of, a lot of folks want to sit around and talk about their fancy mathematical model. And I say that the art of, of forecasting these kinds of events is really no more complicated than comparing trends to fundamentals and asking yourself, do the trends match fundamentals? Or are the fundamentals saying one thing, the trends are another? When they're going in different directions, it means one of two things. Either A, we're going to a bad place, or B, there's a hell of a buying opportunity out there. One <laughs> okay. or the other. Okay. Right? Um, uh, but if, of course, they match, then the answer is yeah, so what? Okay. So so that's that's really the, the quadrants, if you will, uh, that we all have to take a look at. Um, and, and uh, you know, what's intriguing about, about your comment about that uh, again, we haven't talked a lot, but I will tell you a year and a half ago, uh, you remember the world started getting very interesting very quickly Yeah. Um, with, of course, the onset of COVID and the beginning of the shutdowns that happened in March and February of last year. And yet again, the economics community, the forecasting community missed the boat completely. We all heard about the U, the 10-year scarring of the labor market. Mark Zandi predicted. 15% of homeowners are going to default. Um, my former employer was discussing this as a depression-like crisis. Um, and yet here we are in uh, really in the beginning of the third quarter. And by my read of the numbers, not only is the recession long, long, long over that was driven by COVID, but the recovery is finished. We're back on trend. So we had said initially that this was going to be a rapid business cycle. As tragic as the pandemic has been, the economic consequences of pandemics is, is, not, is not what people are saying. And for the most part, 
that has happened. Now, I know we're going to talk a lot about why, and, and I'm eager to do so. Uh, but it does, you know, I, I like to say that, you know, we're, we're two for two at this point in time. Um, and we'll see what happens next time. Okay. Um, I want to take you to the end of 2019. Sure. Because that was an interesting year to me. Because, as you know, following California real estate, as I do, we had a really great set of charts that usually set off inflation of real estate prices. Yeah. We had good affordability. We had reasonably low interest rates, 50 year low unemployment, mm -hmm. no foreclosures in the marketplace. Usually given that scenario, prices in California can take off double digit and do it for years. And we had nothing like that in 2019. Right. Why, why do you think that didn't happen with that great set of charts? Two reasons. Um, first of all, it wasn't all that calm, as you suggest. Remember that 2019 was a year where two things were going on, both which would pull the market off. But one was, of course, we had the change in tax policy under the Trump administration that reduced your, your write-offs, or at least limited them rather than reduced them. For most people, it reduced them. Um, and that, of course, had a modest chilling effect on the market. And 2019 was also a year of rising interest rates. Mortgage rates had come up. Now, both of those things will tend to flatten the market in the short term cool it off a bit. And remember, real estate, residential real estate, always overreacts to drivers. There, there is the whole feedback effect. When nobody's buying, you're not in a rush. When everybody's buying, you're an incredible rush. So you have these modest drivers that in turn created the feedback effect and made a soft market. And well, again, where we are now is the exact opposite of that. Again, let's come back to that in a second. Um, but the other part of it has to do with where we were as a nation um, in 2019. I like to point out the, the irony of, of what was going on back then. Um, at the beginning of 2019, you know, the, the UCR Center, um, which I run, we contribute to the Wall Street Journal Next Recession Survey. Okay. And so I, I kind of track that. And uh, in January of 2019, 80% of economists so we were about to have a recession. 80% of them in the next two years. That's what they said. Okay. And mind you, ultimately, they were right. We did. Yeah. <laughs> now, at the beginning of 2019, I think we could all acknowledge that while they were predicting a recession, they were talking about COVID because COVID didn't even exist at that point in time, at least in the public mind. They were talking about rising interest rates in real estate yet again. If you remember, there were a lot of folks saying the, the real estate markets were all, I mean, there was a, a famous article in the New York Times titled, real estate is already in a recession. You know, what does it mean for the rest of the economy? So people heard that and it intensified that feedback cycle. So fast forward to the beginning of 2020 and the number of economists who, had predict, who were predicting recession in the next two years went from 80% in the beginning of 2019, which we completely disagree with, to 8% at the beginning of 2020, which for us was a victory tour moment, right? Hey, let's go on the road and talk about how smart we were for the recession that didn't happen. And then of course, COVID hits, boom, we're in a recession. Yeah. So, so it, it was an interesting turn of events, how things actually shaped up. Um, but again, all that served to keep real estate very cool in 2019. Let me just circle back about the comment about interest rates rising. So why did interest rates double between 75 and 80, seven and a half to 15 and prices tripled during that journey? Why do we have inflation and high interest rates in the late seventies, early eighties? Well, why did the interest rates not cool the real estate market? It did, it, it exploded. Um, because interest rates aren't necessarily the death knell of real estate. Look, it, it, interest rates are, are something that every real estate investor just function, they has to function into their model, right? You sit down and, and you run numbers um, and you're looking at interest rates, you, you just are. And the, the price you're willing to pay is a function of that interest rate. In other words, it's not high interest rates that are bad for the market. It's um, the increase in interest rates that's bad for the market. 
once once you're there, once you've hit an equilibrium level, once that number has been built into your models, the market can proceed accordingly. So the key here is, is what did hurt real estate was at the beginning of that trend when inflation hit and interest rates did start to rise. That's when real estate cooled off. And that was, of course, in, during those, those big recessions in the early part of the 1980s. Now we came out of that, you're absolutely right, with high interest rates, but real estate had adapted to the new world and could grow accordingly. Okay. So it's, it's again, it's not the level, it's the trend that okay. matters. Well, and what's in, that's uh, to kind of to reiterate, we didn't have a, a high interest rate in 2019. We just had a higher interest rate than we were used to. Exactly. We got spoiled. Exactly. Now you, used the word, you, had, you wrote a report that I read this morning and you used the word that we had complacent buyers, no rush. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the coronavirus hit and the group of complacent buyers changed their tune. <laughs> well, that, two, two things, because there's a little in between there, which we okay. all have to remember, right? Um, and let, let's, let's, and Bruce, let me, let me, let's, let's take a step back from real estate and talk about the business cycle. Okay. That was okay. Um, because it's important to understand the business cycle, why forecasts were wrong and why real estate came screaming out of that business cycle. Because remember at the very beginning of this thing, when you think of, when you think about the COVID recession, let's just talk Q2, okay? okay. Last year, Q2 2020, that was the big quarter. That was the massive decline in economic activity. Um, now, if you go monthly, you'll see it was really the beginning of the quarter. By the end of the quarter, we were already in recovery mode, but there's no doubt that that quarter was ugly. It right. was one of the, it was the ugliest quarter quarter in, in, in US economic history going back to when we really calculated GDP with any degree of reasonableness. Okay. Ugliest ever. So um, yeah, real estate was cold in that quarter. Absolutely it was. Uh, sales were down, permits were way down. It just, nothing was happening. Everybody was in a freak out. But by the third quarter, to your point, real estate came roaring back like nobody's business. Why? Well, let's think about a traditional business cycle. Let's think about what happened, say, during the Great Recession, which was an extreme example of a traditional business cycle. In the run of the Great Recession, we had the subprime lending bubble, massive amounts of money entered the US households system, most of it going to people who we're borrowing money they should never should have been allowed to borrow. Not most of it, but a lot of it. Right. Huge share of it going to people that should not have been allowed to borrow that money. Um, and what that did was in turn really overheated the economy. Now, when everything started to fall apart, the, the subprime cash stopped flowing, the bubble that was inflated by that collapsed in on itself. And there was a general decline in wealth in the United States. Home values and home equity is an enormous share of household wealth just went deep into the red, um, stock market followed, other forms of, of debt followed, and households had a big problem on their hands, which is to say they had lots of debt and all that wealth they had that disappeared like a mirage in the desert. And then a result of that was a demand shock to the US economy. That is to say, how do you deal with the fact that you don't have enough wealth is you save more. And when you save more, you consume less and you consume a little less of everything and every part of the economy suffers. Now, there's no doubt that the Great Recession was led by hits to very specific parts of the economy, housing construction, housing sales, consumer finance, these industries just got wasted, right? right. But there was a general hit to the entire economy that really caused the economy to struggle for years because if there's very weak consumer demand it's such an enormous part of aggregate demand, when that's weak, it's just hard for the economy to grow. And that's what we were seeing for a long time. That's why it was a nine year business cycle, six quarters down, seven and a half years back to trend. Okay. So it was nine years total. It was the longest business cycle we've ever seen. Now, what happened in that second quarter of last year? It was not a demand shock. It was the exact opposite. It was a supply shock. Now, now what does that mean? Um, look, people stopped going to restaurants in, this, in, in 2010 because they couldn't afford it. Okay. In 2020, they stopped going to restaurants because they weren't allowed to go. That's right. They wanted to go, but they weren't allowed. There was a big, no, you're not allowed to go here. Now, 
that's critical because when you have an aggregate demand shock that creates a general malaise across the economy, everybody's suffering. But when you have a supply shock that closes down the 10% of the economy we call services, that demand naturally flows to other parts of the economy because people want to spend, people want to consume. They have the money coming into this pandemic. The US economy was fundamentally very healthy. So what do they do? They started buying other stuff. And we know we, we already we still see that, right? Look at where the economy is today. The re retail inventory to sales ratios are still incredibly low. The supply chains still haven't been able to catch up. The ports are busy. Used car prices are through the roof. Well, this is all representation of the parts of the economy that were overheated by the lack of demand in those service sectors that were closed because of COVID. Okay. Now, of course, a big part of that demand also went into housing. It just did. Why? Well, not only were you saving money because you weren't going out to restaurants, you weren't going to Disneyland, you were stuck at home, which made you realize just how small your home was, particularly with kids. Interest rates fall like a rock. Um, and everybody said, well, hell, I got nothing else to do. Time to move. Yeah. It, and so it set off this frenetic rush to get into housing, which going back to the feedback effect created even more of a rush. And by the end of the year, that thing had just, you know, it was like a chain reaction feedback effect, like the, the beginning of a, a, like the inside of a nuclear bomb, right? Where you get those feedback effects of the uranium atoms splitting apart and stuff happening all over the place. And boom, next thing you know, the market is going atomic. And that's exactly what happened here. Now, you know, what's interesting about you said, because, you know, I was looking at all this stuff, March, April going, okay, wow. You know, what, what is going to happen? Well, the first thing that happened was 50% of the listings were removed. Mm -hmm. So there were a bunch of people that said, well, you're not touring my house. Now, what was yep. interesting when the, when the volume turn returned to normal. So you had a, you had three months of really declined volume. Then you had three months of really increased volume. But after say August of 2020, yeah, you had normal, you had normal demand, if you will, in volume, but it landed on half of the inventory still. Exactly. And, and to your point, and, and I'm glad you said that Bruce, because you're reminding me of one other little factor, which again, yes, has to do with the specifics of COVID. One of the things about COVID is as a seller, particularly when inventories are tight, there's no way you're going to sell your home until you have something else in the hopper, right? That's right. I mean, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Well, you so, also have interest yeah. rate the cheapest ever. So maybe you just refi and say, you know what? Let's add a bedroom, put an office in and let's stay. Exactly. So inventories went down, which yet again feeds back. But it also, of course, goes back to the idea that inventories were pretty low in the first place. Again, going back to fundamentals versus trends. I mean, for all of the, the incredible pessimism about real estate at the beginning of this thing, or the pessimism about real estate in 2019, the reality was this real estate at the beginning of 2020, residential real estate in the United States fundamentally looked the best it had in 30 or 40 years. What do I mean by that? Well, the credit markets, credit market standards were incredibly high. The share of, of borrowers, mortgage borrowers with FICO scores over 720, was, was close to an all-time high level or at an all-time high level. Um, interest rates were still very, very low. You had not had a lot of building no. for a while. Um, uh, you had a, a huge amount of equity in the system. Uh, if you looked at, 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 at mortgage payments, so you know we get data from the American Community Survey, which I rely on, it's wonderful stuff. And it discusses the, the kind of median share of household income used to pay household expenses for those for those uh, households that have mortgages. And that was at a, at, a, at a 10 year low coming into 2019. Now, again, one of the reasons that this just isn't, everybody's like, well, what are you talking about? You know, I didn't hear any of this. Well, no, you didn't because all through the last decade, uh, politicians, state and federal have been creating a crisis on housing that didn't actually exist. We kept hearing how terrible expensive housing was and, and how things were, were dramatically and, and it was the center of the homeless crisis in Southern California and this and that. 
And what's funny is the whole time they were discussing that, the statistics and numbers said the exact opposite. Housing wasn't getting more expensive. We didn't have a housing affordability crisis. No. And, and you know, that, that sort of disconnect is, 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 um, is the kind of thing that does have an impact on markets. It has, a, has an absolute impact on things. What's interesting now is we, you know, California's moved from the high fives to the low eights median price. It yeah. did it in a year. And so um, usually when we're, we're well over, say, 225% of the national price now, the median price. Yeah. That generally creates an exiting of people who finally decide, you know what, I'm never going to be able to afford a house. Oh, and that's happening right now, Bruce. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. To, to but, what extent but, do you think yeah. that will continue? How what? To what extent do you think that will continue? It will continue until somebody in Sacramento gets serious about expanding the housing supply. Look, <laughs> you, you know, you, 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 said, you said something, I think, which is functionally correct, um, but the way you said it was incorrect, okay. if I may. Sure. And what I mean by that is you said, well, I'm never going to be able to afford a house in California, ergo, I have to move to Texas. Um, no, it's not so much you're not going to be able to afford a house. Is that you're not going to win a bidding war. Ergo, you're going to move to Texas. Because somebody bought that house you wanted, and they bought it for a price higher than you could afford. And that's the key. It, you, you have, you know, one house with 20 offers. The, the, the highest income of those 20 people is going to be the one that's going to win that bidding war. And that's the key. Even as prices are going up in California, again, even here, even in this state, the percent of income of household income being used on mortgages has been falling, not rising. Interesting. Okay. And it's and it sounds perverse, but again, remember the people who are winning these bidding wars are very well healed. And there are, again, despite the claims of a lot of politicians who like to say that Americans are starving on their feet, the reality is is there's a lot of very wealthy households in the United States right now. There has been a diminishment of the middle class. What nobody tells you is the majority of those people who left the middle class are moving up, not down. What was interesting, I saw one of the charts that you had. I've never seen the, the breakdown of the income of the people that leave. Yeah. I had never yeah. seen that source. So it's lower income folks. Yeah, the more majority of the people are making less than seventy-five grand, which does put them out of the chance of buying something. But oh, absolutely, and, and who can blame them for leaving? And and I don't. But what I say is 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 this going to crush the California economy? Of course not. Of course not. California, in fact, I would argue, is going to look better. I mean, if you get lower income people out, um, you look better. <laughs> Let them go to Texas, so our economy looks more equitable. It's. Look, if you go to if you go to if you go to Bel Air Country Club, things look pretty equitable. Everybody's rich, right? <laughs> okay. Now, me okay. personally, I don't want to live in Country Club, California, but California. that's exactly what we're creating. And until we get serious about expanding housing supply, that isn't going to change. Okay. And what do, what's the likelihood of of you of you seeing that happen? Well, now you're asking me to do political forecasting, Bruce, and that's I'm not I'm not a political okay. forecaster. Look, I, I know there's some guys in Sacramento who are Yimbies who do understand what the problem truly is. They're trying hard to get things through. I mean, I think of Scott Weiner and all the the very good efforts that guy has made um, to improve density around transit, to to loosen up the the permitting process. I, I mean, the guy knows what's going on. He's aggressive. He's he's trying to do something about it but he just keeps getting blocked. Yes. So the question is, is, is will they ever be able to build a coalition large enough to overcome the NIMBYs in Sacramento? Uh, and, and I don't know, I don't, I don't, I'm not enough of a Sacramento watcher to give you the, the odds of that, of that change. Okay. That's gonna do it for part one of our interview with Beacon Economics founder, Dr. Christopher Thornburg. Be sure to catch part two next week. See you then.
For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.